Hi, I'm Hannes. Hello, I'm Dominic. And today in the reading group, we have Relating Graph Neural Networks to Structural Causal Models by Matej Cicevic. And don't forget to subscribe and that you can join our reading group sessions yourself. Yeah, so just as a as a quick uh, quick intro on this one, um, it's a it's a bit of a variant of a, of a talk I gave recently. But given that this format is a reading group, which is really cool, we can make this more interactive. And uh, so, really, let's let's just keep it a rolling discussion. Um, I'll make this a little bit bigger than than just a paper to also have like this what I mentioned earlier, this self enclosed aspect of of really letting this be a reference. And uh, I mean, Hannes told me also you have this really nice Slack channel, so uh, I can gladly share the slides for anyone who's interested who might not be actually researching in this direction or who, who just wants to jump in there. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here and talk today. I've been sick the last week, so please bear with me if I have to drink some water or stop here and there. Um, but I'm, I'm feeling better now, so yeah, let's get into it. So uh, this talk is titled Towards Neurocausality. So you see a little bit of a big uh, name here. And the, the subtitle is the name of the paper, Relating Graph Neural Nets, which is a big focus of this reading group, to structural causal models, which is a big focus of my research interest. So to have a kind of short, too long, did not read, so, so really a takeaway message of, of the endeavor, I guess, that we, we pursued here is really that, you know, merging causality and concepts of it with modern deep learning is not futile. On the contrary, we have actually made collectively now as researchers uh, a lot of uh, discovering promises, promising steps, right, to, towards, towards that bigger goal of, of, you know, what maybe Benjo referenced recently in his keynote, System 2 AI, right, by using causality. So this wouldn't be a talk about causality if we didn't talk about question why. Right? So, so, so why? Well, there was a recent attention. So, so we just saw how Hannes also gave a, a nice uh, a, a tweet of, a, a, about this talk today, but also our co-author Peter Velichkovic also did a nice retweet. And um, in general, we had Yuda Pearl himself, also his student and also uh, Professor Columbia Elias, uh, and, and generally, many people very interested in, in, in this direction, right? Because um, this area of integration between causality and, 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 and also graph neural nets is still not really that much uh, scattered out. Um, so, so I guess that's, that's why we are sitting here today. <laughs> I think a theoretical milestone was a recent work, which I think was also now accepted to NeurIPS. So you see here the arch archive indicator, but I think it was accepted to NeurIPS. Um, by Jia, Li, Benjo, and Badenboim, where they really managed to, you know, formalize this notion of, of neural causal models, right? So, so basically parameterized SEMs, SEMs in the in our machine learning real world that you can touch, right? But obviously this was not all. So, so Kochaolu et al. or Rosemary Kay et al., uh, they already did these kinds of things more or less. So for example, the, the work you see on the button here, um, they actually already used that notion of neural causal models. It's just that this uh, new recent milestone was theoretical, right? So, so they really formalized all these things. But then when you look at, for example, the causal GAN, right? So, so a lot of people have already tried to, you know, kind of integrate causality with deep learning, um, but also the, this effort of, of um, yeah, um, rather trying to take the principles from causality opposed to really making causality the, the, the new learning thing. So to quote our Turing Award, Yuda Pearl here, so you know he's saying like to build in truly intelligent machines, you know teach them cause and effect, right? So so this I really want you to understand that this is kind of the bigger motivation here. So so collectively as researchers in causality, we believe we can get here answers uh, that really lead us to what we all seek, right? AGI, artificial general intelligence. Yeah? That term itself might be a little bit uh, convoluted because. Originally, AI was always about AGI, right? And so all the impressive achievements of deep learning amount to just curve fitting. This was something he said in an interview. And then also, I think there was a tweet and, and this got really a lot of people going because obviously it's a very strong statement about what people care a lot, right? I mean, people care about their research. And then when you tell them, hey, <laughs> it's just curve fitting, that's very harsh. But I think it stirred a very important discussion, one which we are doing today. 
So to get you with uh, with the concepts a little bit here, so what you see on the left is kind of this cartoon of this pearl causal hierarchy, right? And also another important theoretical work by uh, Elias Bahnboim and others was really the, the statement that, well, this hierarchy will be intact. So, so really uh, interlayer inferences, right? Going from layer one to two and so on, um, they have their rules and, 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 and they will, um, keep you from going from example from lower to higher levels but the other way works and generally what is this about you see for example here this this robot or this owl you know they are concerned with seeing um, then you have the neanderthal and, and and the babies they are starting to do things they might push a cube off of the of the dinner table and, and and suddenly learn oh there's gravity right and then there's imagining here you have someone like einstein who's really retrospective about the things right and we know these concepts as like association in the first level intervention or manipulation in the second and counterfactuals in the third and so what would be if not, right? So, so let's just look at this uh, example real quick. So this one which Huda Pearl gives in his recent book, um, where you see on the right side now data points, right? So each of these points is some kind of data from a patient recorded, where you see uh, the exercise that the patient is doing uh, and their cholesterol levels, right? And you see you can fit this really nice regression curve here, this linear regression, which kind of indicates to you, well, if I do more exercises, my cholesterol will jump high. And obviously, I mean, this is this is not what we expect, right? And and actually, when you use now causality, causality's concepts, and and look at in this case this confounder age, right, or this consolidation, then you see this this uh, grouping, right? That actually, well, there are these negative causes, right? causal links, but um, they are just disguised in the total data population. Another very famous uh, example is given by Jonas Peters and others, where here you look at uh, activity of a gene A and of a gene B against the phenotype. And you're now asking a question, well, what would happen if the activity, for, what, for whatever reason, was, was to be set to zero, right? So, so imagine you can control it. So, so, so what do we expect to predict now for the phenotype? And you can see now in these for gene A on, in, the, in the top row and gene B in the bottom row, that this is actually different behavior. So for gene A, it is in fact causing the phenotype. So you should be predicting low levels for the phenotype. But for gene B, there is a confounder actually causing both. So actually setting the activity to zero will change nothing. And so the best guess you can have, so imagine here again, we could fit a linear regression line and um, yeah, the best answer you can give is, I don't know, because, well, you, you can't know, right? So, so in this case, 50-50 chance you'll be right. And, and this is just not good. So I guess also to define the term now, right? I think it's really akin to artificial intelligence in general, that really with neuro causality, we are now trying to integrate causality with neural based methodologies. And why do we want to do that? Well, they have been so successful, right? It, it just makes sense. Okay, here now a short primer on, on just key concepts which we'll fly through. So here you see causal inference 101. So in general, the key concept is this structural causal model. It's important for us to define here because this is what we are going to talk about mostly. And you know, you describe these mechanistic relations of variables, right? And and so so each variable, each node, right? So you see on the right side x, y, and z. Um, each of them is, is is caused by its parents and some noise term. U usually stands for something like unmodeled. And now, depending on, on the assumptions on, on, on the distribution of the noise terms, you might talk about the Markovian SCM. So when the distribution factorizes, right, so all of the noise terms are actually independent, then you have a Markovian SCM. If they don't, right, if, if you really have basically shared uh, noise terms, then uh, you have something like hidden confounding, basically. And um, then this whole story changes a lot for causality. But we mostly consider now here the Markovian SCM because it's also just easier to talk about. And another key concept in causality is that of intervention, right? So, so or manipulation, which is denoted by this famous do operator, right? So, so you do something. You say do uh, w is equal to g subscript w, right? And this could then look like you see on the right side, you basically cut off the dependence to its parents and really just set that value to that value. And um, yeah, another important view also on, on just the valuation. So if you want to now get this interventional distribution, so 
you look at the variables w and you intervene on the variable z with some intervention then really what this is is an accumulation of all the worlds right so of all the u terms the unmodeled terms which are consistent with uh, this this view that you're looking at so i can uh, recommend all of these things on the slide here so so these are pointers and and as i said i'll uh, share the slides and so really people can really dig into it and I think these are amazing references for really getting a grasp of, of cause, causality and causal inference and all related concepts. So then the second thing right so, so Hannes was already mentioned this that uh, we have this related work section covering multiple of these things because we, we use them throughout the paper. And uh, variational inference, interestingly enough, when you really look at the, the assumptions and everything, you also have this, 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 this setting where you have these latent, these, these uh, relevant variables, right? You can see them as causes. And uh, what you really want to do is now here is see it from an optimization perspective that you basically um, have this, this posterior you're trying to optimize for with your variational family Q, right? So imagine this a mixture of Gaussians or, or just a Gaussian. And um, you're trying to now optimize this, find the best candidate fit, right? So it's um, opposed to these Monte Carlo approaches and these sampling based approaches. And you know, the evidence is the problem here, it's in intractable. So you see this integral over the sets, and I mean, what are those sets, right? And um, what this, however, leads to is this lower bound, right? This evidence lower bound. Um, which is then again the natural uh, formulation of the variational autoencoder, which a lot of people know, even if they might not be aware of this formulation. And what it consists of is this expectation on the left side, you have like this, this reconstruction, and then also regularizer. And if you are familiar maybe or heard from this entanglement, um, this regularizer, right, if, if you reweight them, then uh, you can factorize the distribution, for instance, and, and, and for this create this entanglement which is then again very related to, to causality. Here again, pointers to it. Yeah, this is the last one. So this one I, I'll talk less, obviously. So in GNNs, we just have this inductive bias on graphs, right? And, and we have generally these three flavors, convolution, attention, message passing, and, and one is kind of bigger than the other, but also harder to achieve. And again, also references, obviously referring Peter here. So, <laughs> and also the more, more recent uh, geometric deep learning. Okay, so now GNNs, NCMs, and SCMs. So to remind you, so, so this is the paper we are now, now diving deeper into. So it's, it's still under review and it's with Devendra, Peter, and, and Christian. Um, and here we now look at these two things that we're interested in, GNNs and the SCMs. So we started from first principles, really. Uh, so, so there's this famous statement by Holland and Rubin. So no causation without manipulation, right? And, and so while this generally not, not true, so you know, identifiability itself, right? The do calculus and all these great works by, by Perl and collaborators, they suggest that you, know, you can actually express uh, these manipulations without doing the manipulation, which is, I mean, just amazing. But um, they are still a very important concept, right? So, when you can do them, and which you often actually can do, right? I mean, not all of them are, are ethically uh, non-correct or, or just not available or infeasible. You can actually do them because, I mean, reinforcement learning, right? So there's been this great stride now by Elias Barnbaum and others. You can see these actions as interventions. And so naturally, you know, interventions change the structural causal model as we saw, and as we see on the right side. So, so you see that um, the, the interventional distribution in, 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 in CFRAC1, so SCM1, um, is uh, equal in this case to the conditional, right? So, so Y given X only without the do X, but then the other SCM, in the one where you cut the edge to the parent um, and not equal to its own conditional, right? So, so this is really what happens when you have confounding. Confounding is just another word for common cause, right? So, so Z is a confounder, a common cause of X and Y. And so we asked our question now, well, what does it mean to intervene on an end on the GNN, right? So, so we really just, I mean, we didn't know. We, we just said, okay, let, let, let's go. And um, we, we came up with this. So you see on the left side now, this SCM, and usually this is unobserved, right? So, so I think this is an important note to make. Uh, you might have partial information on it, but usually not really the, the whole thing. Otherwise, I mean, you're done. <laughs> and um, what you can read off is the graph, right? 
it can create some data and it implies the causal hierarchy by that, right? So this le the different levels we've discussed earlier. And so we said, okay, well, the graph is the common ground with the GNN. <laughs> so it seems sensible to kind of look into that, right? And this is really where, where all the magic happened, right? So, so we saw, okay, yeah, we can have a, a directed acyclic graph, which is usually the common notion for, for, for causality um, and, 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 and have that in the GNN, right? And, and now just, really look at this modified neighborhood right so so you see that now we look not on the the regular neighbors uh, n but on on these modified neighbors m which are really just the regular neighbors but without the parental connections right because you delete that dependency and so this is really just also what our definition here is stating in the paper right that if you now have an intervention on some subset of of, of your very systems variable um, that this uh, computation layer here you see in equation one um, is really just acting on this modified uh, neighborhood without the parents. And we generally just refer to this then as an interventional GNN layer, right? It's only natural. So definition one, you know, allows to, for the GNN then to actually go beyond L1, right? So, so you can now talk about interventions. But one big question is then, okay, well, what does um, what 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 about the confections, right? So so what about the the full layer, right? Uh, the full PCH, and and this was an important thing, right? So we we want to think about this because you know you might call it interventional then only, right? And and not causal, right? But what is a, a causal GNN or something like that? And so uh, we interpreted these messages uh, within this general GNN formulation differently. So so we said okay. Um, especially if you now just imagine a linear SCM, for instance, right? You can really have these dependency terms for each of these um, uh, parental connections, right? So you don't look at the mechanism as a whole with all its arrows pointing, but each of them separately. So you can see them as, as causal effects, direct descriptions. And so we came to our first uh, main result in a sense for, for, for the theory aspect that uh, really, if you consider now this, um, uh, general GNN computation, then you can actually choose these spaces such that, you know, you don't violate the Shannon's properties and everything and actually model those structural equations. And so to do that, essentially, we have kind of this picture here. I'm just giving an example. So basically, we can decompose a structural equation into these causal dependencies on a parental level. And so if you imagine our linear SEM, this is really just purely parental. It must not be a linear SEM though, right? It's really, it's more of the question of which of those decompositions actually make sense, which of them are interesting to look at. And I mean, obviously there's a trivial one, obviously there's a linear one, but I think there are also some exciting uh, intermediate cases. And a binary example here is, so in the first line you see this, the CFRAC is the SEM. So it consists of, this set of structural equations, one for X and one for Z, you see that there is an error from Z to, to, to X. So Z is cause and X. So Z is the cause, X is the effect. And it's really just this, this conjunction here. It's really just this end operator, this logical end. And now if you look uh, in, the, in the bottom row on the left side, you see now this, this, uh, these, these four cases, right? So we look at binary variables, UX either zero or one or, or, or Z either zero, zero and one. And obviously an AND operator will only fire if both are active, right? And so now on the right side, you, you can formulate this into this decomposition by, for instance, just having that term, which is depending on Z, be just the identity. And then the other term being this noise term minus the disjunction, right? So, so the OR op operator. And so with this theorem, one works, right? And, and it's actually very cool because you know you have this really this, this conversion between SCM and GNN. But then again, you know, it doesn't talk about optimization. And, and, and that's you know, when you especially come from a practical standpoint and don't want to just talk about interesting connections on a theoretical level. Um, basically it, it makes it very hard, right? And and also, there's another problem that, well, these message computing is, is shared, right? And, and this is the, the key thing here. So essentially, you have to have a lookup table in this function, right? And I mean, this, this is rather difficult learning this because all of these structural equations have, you know, for each of the variables, you'll have a specific function. 
So that's kind of what motivated us to look at something else. So, so what happens if we say, yeah, I mean, we, 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 we allow now for violations. We allow now for this to not be as strict. We allow for the, the shared function, which makes it a GNN though, right? To, to, to kind of be kicked out. And it's actually interesting because what happens here is what we call this NCM type two. So as you saw, this, this Chi et al, they had like this uh, theoretical mindstone on, on NCMs, so these parameterized SCMs. And now what we found here is that coming from the GNN perspective, right, that's rather interesting. So you don't come from the side of the SCM, but you come from the other way around, you come from the neural models now. And, and you say, okay, I, I, this won't be a GNN anymore because I violate the shareness, but I can now uh, view it more fine grained. Now I can have for each of the structural equations, actually each of the structural dependency terms, I can have a, a multiplayer perceptron, a, a neural net. And with this, I get a new NCM. So they looked at this NCM on a structural equation level, but now you look at each of the parents' edges. And by doing so, you actually get a more fine grained view. You, you might actually get benefits in interpretability. Right? Because now you can look at these more simpler functions, even when you have in total a very complex system. And so we think they're very worthwhile investigating in future research. Um, but anyhow, worthwhile just mentioning from, from a theoretical standpoint. And to you know, illustrate this, so on the left with these uh, rectangles, you red rectangles, you see the, the NCM regular, right? So, so each variable will have a neural net modeling it. And on the right side, you see now this, this new model, which we found coming from that GNN view, right? Where you basically have each of these edges actually additionally uh, being covered by neural nets. And so we have now seen three flavors as well, right? So, so it, it's, it's interesting how we can also pose it here in this context. So three flavors of this GNN-based neural causality. And so the first one was the IGNN, which will then be used in a variation of autoencoder context. So this we'll introduce in a minute, but um, in general, the IGNN is, is what is causal about this. Obviously, it's the least expressive one, so it's only interventional. It doesn't talk about counterfactuals, but the training difficulty and cost are both easy and low, right? So SCM GNN is complete, but it's very, very tough. NCM type 2, well, it's, it's, it's a lot easier while being complete, right? And, and that's why we, we think it's so interesting. So our research selection then was actually going with the IGNN because we said, okay, this is a reading group on GNNs and we want to give a talk here. So obviously we're going to go in this direction. Um, no, I'm just joking. So <laughs> from the neural causal viewpoint, you know, this model is actually, oh yeah, Hannes? Yeah, can we maybe go back to the last slide if you're saying the cost is high? Like, what do you mean with high? Yes, so um, basically, for example, when you look at the SCM GNN, right? Then um, you really, so, so your optimization will be very difficult, right? So, so basically getting a, a, a solution to, 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 to your SCM, right? From, from data, just through means of optimization, it will be very non-convex and it will be hard to optimize. Okay, and I guess that's, so in the chat, we have the question, like does it, if we have a large structural causal model, is um, SCM genuine, for example, something we can even use or even consider? I, I, I think, I mean, yeah, it's a good question. I haven't done that, I don't know. Um, but um, I'd imagine it's, 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 it's out of scope. I think that's really just, I think that one is, is rather theoretical uh, play, play for, for the moment, yeah. All right. Oh, we have another hand raising from, um, Hannes, can yes. you maybe just, the people are... um, so I would like to know how you determine the training difficulty and the training cost. Do you have empirical experiments oh, no. uh, on that or yeah. not? Good, good, good point. So, so, so this is nothing which is uh, in, in the paper like this. We have some descriptions where we argue, okay, why it's difficult because, for example, for the SCM GNN, it, it uh, scales with, um, um, with, 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 I mean, basically, so in the worst case, you could have like for each edge in the system, right, uh, such a such a neural net. So it scales actually very horribly, right, because these these DAGs grow super exponentially. Um, here, it's it's really just a, a, a quick kind of overview from my intuition following, which I just uh, put here. Yeah. 
All right, then let's let's keep it going. Okay. Yes. So really, just uh, as I said just now, um, you know, from this neurocausal viewpoint, it's actually very interesting now to look at the model for the first time more formally, which actually trades off expressivity against model description, right? So really, with this IGNN-based models, um, you are not describing each structural equation. You are not describing each structural causal dependency. You are really just summarizing all these things together, right? Obviously, that comes at the cost of expressivity. That's why you cannot do counterfactuals. But I mean, this gets more a lot more practical now. So now let's look at GNN-based causal inference. So um, constructing now GNNs from causal graphs, right? So, so this was an important distinction to make. So we in general call it a GNN if we can intervene on its interventional GNN, right? But actually, we can make another connection with the SCM. Well, the SCM implies a causal graph, right? It is this semantic structure, like, like I mean, historically, it comes from the Bayesian networks, right? And um, they are a semantic decomposition of these mechanisms. And um, this GFRAC, GNN construction now in definition two, is really just saying, OK, you take your GNN layer, right? And you make your SCM estimate, right? Your, your structure SCM estimate be that graph that you're using, right? Then you can call it this GGNN. And um, also another consequence actually from our definition one is that actually intervention will be nat natural to the way they occur to SCMs, right? Which was one of the things Yuda was actually mentioning in his tweets, which, which he liked. Um, so basically you can really just, you know, if you have this, this, this shared uh, graph between the SCM and the GNN, uh, then an intervention the way we defined it is really just producing the same mutilation. And so now, you know, you can do this, uh, this, this causal generative model based on IGNNs, right? And, and we chose this variational graph autoencoder architecture, which is, I think, also getting more and more popular. I mean, we have seen a lot of these vari variants also in this uh, neural re uh, relational inference and, and all these uh, works which are inferring, for example, structures um or learning some latent spaces for some downstream tasks and here we really just say okay we actually use both um the encoder and decoder as these IGNN layers right so this is what we do in intervention in in, in definition five so we say that this IVGAE is simply using these IGNN layers and um it's actually for both encoder and decoder with it, which is rather uncommon but with this you can assure that the information is available in, in, in both of these models. And there's also some other benefits, which we which we discuss in more detail in the paper. So this is how it looks like, right? So so you see this uh, this V model on the top, right? Which is, uh, oh yeah, Hannes? Yeah, before we get into your uh, yeah, IVGAE, um, we have the question by Guadalupe. Well, yeah. You, you introduced this, um, NCM type two, where we also model the the causality, so to say, with networks, or have model the edges with additional networks. And now, yeah, we have yeah, and then we always have the same function for all pairs of nodes. And her question: Doesn't this violate the requirement of independence of causal mechanisms? The functions represent causal mechanisms, right? So with the sharedness of parameters you're saying that causal mechanisms all are the same oh yes yeah. so, so that's a very interesting point very interesting and detailed point so independence of mechanisms right so so really you just want to say that these mechanisms don't inform each other right and and they also don't inform the cause right so these are the fundamental principles i can really recommend looking into the the peter set al book right so elements of causal inference they, they really cover that in their early sections of the book very well. And um, I don't think we are well violating here. And I think the, the, the difficulty maybe to see is, so it's, it's a very interesting point. The way I understand the question, so you have um, the, 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 when you have the sharedness, right? So you have this one learned, learned function basically, um, which is basically taking care of all the um, the mechanisms and and this would kind of okay make you think uh, yeah this violates now the shadness property but um, the um, 
the way, for example, right, this 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 works, right? So so in the proof, when you look, we we and and what I showed earlier was that um, it would essentially boil down to a lookup table, at least in one case, right? And in the lookup table, you are kind of splitting these aspects. I'd argue so you are not violating the independence, but I mean you are not getting there anywhere in the first place. Okay. Yeah. Um sorry but in your case um if you're using the same function knowing the like i guess the value of one function does give you information about the value of another function because it's the same right so knowing one in this case one causal mechanism is giving you information about another causal mechanism um so i still think like i I mean, you said in the case that you know you have different functions for each uh, each edge, that resorts to, of course, a lookup uh, table because it's it's a different one for each. But then in this case, I, I I don't see why like how you're not like violating the uh, so, the independence. So so you you think there is is basically information being shared because of the fact that it's being encoded in one single uh, network. Because it's one single function uh, that's operating between all pairs of nodes, um, so it's like you know at the end of the day that's a matrix, right? That's uh, like transforming node features. So that matrix is the same for all pairs of nodes. But I think the the big difference here is, I mean, it knows which nodes it's looking at, right? And I think that's the key here because it knows where it's looking at. It can now uh, separate them. So you just imagine, I mean, this ridiculous size function, that's why I'm saying you're not getting there anywhere, right? But you can reason about it theoretically. Oh, we have another. Uh... Sounds good, thanks. Oh, sure, sure. Looking forward to our meeting next week. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, do you want to go ahead? Hey, yeah, basically my question is, do we assume that we know the structure? Do we know the edges? Do we know the connectivity of the structure? And we just try to predict the effect of the intervention? Or we also try to understand and discover somehow the structure of the network? Is there an assumption that we know that in advance? So, so we are not talking here about structure discovery. That's correct. So, so we are not really, I mean, where you got it, whether you have the true causal model, whether you have partial causal model, doesn't really matter. It's really just about these, these, these new different models here that you can look at and, and what it means and how it relates to what we know about GNNs. Thank you. Um, and does having a single function that applies um, to to all the edges means that the model will perform better, like at the fundamental level when you you're looking at like uh, small pieces of a puzzle, than when you're looking at uh, a a general graph? So what I mean here is, for example, um, would it perform better in a quantum mechanical setting where the particles are the fundamental parts with a few laws? Then, when you look at um, the interaction that uh, humans can have with objects, which is much more complex than like th these fundamental laws, uh, or do you think this can still apply also at a high complexity level? So, is the quit now? I'm, I'm trying to understand the question better. So, is the question um, now regarding um, the the fact that you know? When you have something specific, like a specific model, it, it'll fit better maybe than a general model, which has to compromise between different models? Or, or what is the exact question? Like, uh, I mean, here you're looking uh, by sharing the um, by sharing the parameters across all edges, from my understanding is that um, it's kind of generating, you kind of trying to learn a general fundamental law that applies to the network. And my question is that, um, can, is this more applicable in, in the interactions that we know have fundamental laws uh, like uh, physics and quantum mechanics and things like that? Uh, or can it also be general? Like, is it, uh, can it also learn uh, highly complex interactions and functions as well? 
Okay, so, so I think regarding the first point, um, so really just, um, you're not learning here fundamental law, right? Because what you can maybe say is that these specific structural equations themselves, right, are corresponding maybe uh, in, in, in some, now let's say natural physics SCM to the mechanisms, right? I mean, that's also a view that people usually take, for example, in, in Peter Sedal especially, right? They, they also come from that physics perspective. And so, um, you know, one equation could be, for example, I mean, imagine the causal relation between the altitude of a place and the temperature of that place, right? And you would always say, okay, altitude is actually causing the temperature, right? Because if I now go onto the Matterhorn in Switzerland, right, it'll be very cold, right? But if I stay here in, 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 in Darmstadt in Germany, maybe, then uh, it's going to be warm, right? So you have this going higher up, right, for physical reasons, physical mechanisms, it's decreasing the temperature, right? And so you have now a bunch of these mechanisms, right? Interacting with each other, right? The causal system. And now when you have this sharedness, right? I mean, you still, I mean, the true reality is still those separate mechanisms. Also like Guadalupe said, right? You, you have this independence also of these mechanisms, right? And so um, I don't think it's actually better if, if you now were to try to learn something which is actually violating that because the true reality is not working like that. At least that is what we are assuming or, or expecting. Okay, thanks. Uh, and to come back on uh, Mikhail's questions about, um, like about learning the structure of the graph, like uh, if there is an error in the causality of the graph, like in the structure of the causality, um, is uh, the model able like to compensate for that error or like uh, if there is a link that is there that shouldn't be there um, is the model able to compensate for that and uh... yeah so so I guess that's a very important good you know it's a general question so um, I mean the true causality aspect is anyhow always a very difficult one right I think you know also the, the question of scope is always missed out, right? So, so we might talk about, you know, altitude and temperature, right? But as you also said earlier in your question, right? You, you can now go into the quantum level, right? And, and maybe go even further beyond if we as scientists find out more, right? And, and, and then where do you stop, right? Where does the scope end? When does continuous become discrete, right? I think, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think when you have here now the model, I mean, it, it, it is self, I don't, it doesn't really have, like, let's assume now you have some causality, which you say, okay, this is actually the ground truth now, and now you have errors in those. Um, I mean, the model itself does not have any way of compensating, right? And I think it's very specific also to the setup you're looking at, right? So where does your data come from? Does it now actually, you know, is it, I mean, it should usually come from the true model, right? And now you have made the mistake, um, so the information should also be still in the data, right? So, so we pick it up, but then again, what kind of data, right? Because on the PCH, on the per causal hierarchy, you can have these different levels of the data, right? You can have the associational, you can have the intervention, you can have the counterfactual. And so if, if we know, let's say, okay, assume again, we, we know it's, it's maybe coming from the interventional, right? Then, um, yeah, I don't see it, it recovering then. <laughs> because obviously it's, it's made a mistake. Um, but I think it's a very, very important question actually you're asking here because, and I mean, it's implicit also in all these structure discovery methods, right? Because they try to learn a structure and, and well, they have to have some protocol of going against mistakes. Perfect, then we can get to your IVJE. Okay. So yeah, so so maybe just to to go uh, one one slide back. So so really what we said, right? So now we look at this variation autoencoder structure, and uh, we'll now replace the autoencoder and in, so so the autoencoder part, the encoder and decoder, um, the generator and model with uh, IGNNs. And then what it looks like oh, is like this here on this 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 slide here, where you have now this this V model, right? And now when you do an intervention here on the variables y, then it changes obviously the adjacency, which then again, obviously changes these, these, these GNN layers. 
uh, and what they are computing. And what you see here on the bottom is really just an SCM, or it could be a parameterized SCM, so so a neural causal model, and how it goes through the through the through the process, right? So so both are capable of predicting interventional distributions, which obviously includes the regular associational case, right? So it's always a superset, right? I mean, if you don't intervene on anything, you are in the regular case, and the difference here is that the IVG, right, it, it takes the data, while the the uh, model on the on the on, on, the, on the bottom, right, the, the SCM is really just a sim simulator of the world, right. So, so you're just taking out these noise terms, and 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 then evaluate one by one each of these mechanisms that we just talked about. And so now we come to a very important concept that we have to make for the paper, right. So. Um, it's about causal expressivity now, right? So, so we we need to talk about how expressive we actually are in a, in a causal sense, and um, remember as well, right, that the IVJE is not an SCM, right? So it really trades this expressivity now against model description. So it trades, you know, being able to talk about a lot against, uh, yeah, being very compact. And what we define is a notion of partial consistency. So when you look at, for example, Chia et al. Uh, it's very parallel to the, their notion, but opposed to having all distributions have to map, which is infinite, uh, we we have this partial connect consistency, right? And so obviously for this, um, the, the 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 number of matchings, right? Uh, the 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 higher is the consistency with a certain SCM, right? So so this is more less of a black white notion, but more of a, of a grayish notion. And again, note, right, so, so L1 is usually just one, right, so you have just this observational uh, distribution, while the L2, I mean, start with a continuous intervention and then just go through all the natural numbers you already at infinite, so. And yeah, with this, we could actually, you know, also be now very um, parallel to, to, to this causal hierarchy theorem, right, and this is really what, what we're saying here, right, so, so the causal hierarchy theorem originally, it says that causal inference will make sense, right? So it, 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 it tells you basically that, well, whatever you do on layer one won't imply layer two, right? Because, well, if it did, then layer one is sufficient for everything, right? So there's nothing gained. And they are saying, no, there is strict borders, right? So so it's it's not like the EU, you, you know, you, you have borders still, right? So it's not like the Schengen, Schengen Raum. <laughs> and um, we can do the same thing here with the IVJE, right? Just that we have this partial causal hierarchy theorem because our consistency notion is is a partial one, right? So so we're saying okay, if if you know they match on on, on this level one, um, then it uh, the the implication at level two uh, is 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 also satisfied. You know, it collapses with this Lebesgue measure to zero. Um, and with this, you can actually then make another statement about L three, which we already knew, right? But now just a little bit formal. That we say, okay, you will not find actually an IVJE now that could be on any level be consistent with uh, with the counterfactual case. So, but now we <laughs> we go more to the practical part. So, so we are asking now, okay, well, we talk now theoretically. We saw these three different models, right? We we saw just the IGNN itself. We saw these SCM to GNN conversion, but we also saw this um, this um, uh, NCM type two model, right? And um, as I also pointed out earlier, or hinted at earlier, uh, for the first time now we inspected the neural model, which is not really an SCM, right? So, I mean, at least in the, for the first time in, in this formal setting, right? After this uh, uh, ground formulation by, by, by Chia et al. And um, yeah, so, so now we want to kind of consider, okay, uh, the, the causal power of, also in, in relation to the SCM, right? And I think that's really interesting. I mean, that's the whole idea and whole goal we are having, right? We are, we are trying to kind of bring causality into machine learning and help us, you know, get closer to AI. And the, all the great things about our modern models, right? I mean, differentiability, right? Being deep, being able to structure, uh, do structured inferences, right? So all these aspects. And, and, and now we talked about the neural model, uh, yeah, which is really not an SCM, but really something yeah, we know out of deep learning. And so now we get to this question of identifiability and estimation. So, yeah, Hannes. Or not. <laughs> yeah, if we go back a few slides to your corollary three. Yes. Yeah. Um, where 
Okay, so in the chat we have the question, is the consequence of the sharedness of the GNN? Oh, yes, so, so this is really just a concept. So, so, so it's a consequence of the fact that you are not modeling all of the structural equations, right? That you basically have no natural way of doing it like an SCM. I mean, just now think of an SCM, right? So, so let's say the altitude and, 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 and the temperature now, right? So we know altitude is, is, is causing the temperature, right? It's, it's a negative causal effect, right? So the higher your altitude, the, the, the less your, your temperature. And now you, let's say you, you model, so, so you have to go um, chronologically, you have to go, <laughs> go with the topology of, of the system. And so you will start with altitude now, right? So you will evaluate, you will have some random point. Let's say now it's, it's, it's going to, to be, you know, Matterhorn, so it's going to be high. And now you plug that information plus another no noise term, which will basically dictate that you are looking now at the Matterhorn and, um, or at least the equivalence class of a Matterhorn, and now um, give you the temperature for that place, right? Which will be low, obviously. So, so you really just, you know, you go one by one, you, you, you get the noise terms, you can get them all, all at once, essentially. And then you just go topologically the SCM structure, right, with its mechanisms. Whether they are right or wrong, we are not talking about. And um, with this, you then get your final product, right? You get your data point. <laughs> That's why it's also called the data generating process, right? That's why, you know, in, in statistics, we always looked at the joint model, right? So, so the joint distribution, right? I, I look at five variables, and now I have the joint configuration, and I can tell you the probability of of each of these uh, configurations, right? If, if they are binary, then it's two to the power of five, right? And, um, and um, this used to be, right? But then with Yuda Pearl and, and, and these guys, what happened was, well, now you have the SCM, which is actually the new queen, right? It's the new thing. It's the new kid on the block, right? It's the thing which is generating your joint distributions, right? So, and it's generating them according to which intervention, if at all, you are doing, right? And which kind of queries you're asking. And so um, the limitation really just comes from the fact that you cannot, um, yeah, you, 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 you just have two neural nets opposed to, uh, number of edges many basically right and i mean you can make the argument obviously you could encompass them right but it's not um it's 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 not the way that uh yeah it, it doesn't follow this this systematic step of, of generating the data right oh you have a question hi hey, may i just step up for a second just as a follow-up yeah. Okay. So uh, maybe just to uh, summarize, I guess like this is not a, a limitation of mm -hmm. the NCM type two that you are describing, right? It's just a limitation because of modeling the GNNs, the encoder and the decoder, only using these two functions, right? Or am I missing something here? No, no, so, no. It is indeed a limitation because you are not able to talk about counterfactuals, right? Which will require you, you know, to have both the conditioning aspect and the intervening aspect, right? I mean, there's no way for your model to do that. That's essentially the limitation part. I mean, it's, okay. it's just a statement on, on well, it's designed like that, right? But if, so in my question, it, it would be more in the side, like if you allow for the violation of the sharpness, then it would be possible to model the L3. So no, no, the, the, NCM, the, three consistence. the NCM type two can do it. Don't forget. Exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it can do it. That was my, it, my question. Yeah, no, no. That, it can do it. it. Just this is just talking about the IVGA. Yes. Okay. So, because it's just using these two models. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Essentially, you, you can sum it up as, as that um, yeah, the IVGA is not an SCM, and that's why it not works, right? But all the others are SCMs, right? Just uh, different notions of it they would all basically fall into the class of SCMs. They would be a subset of it. Okay, so I'm going back to identifiability, right? So, so let's just clarify what that exactly means. So um, identification is the process where you take your causal quantity and the causal quantity will now be, for example, your interventional distribution or your counterfactual. And now you want to express it in, in L1 terms, in statistical terms only, right? So, so no do. So, so you go from something which has do to something which has no do's in there, right? And, and that's the pro process of identification, right? So, so getting there, getting this thing, and, and I guess the most famous tool is, well, probably the most famous tool is actually the back door adjustment, but um, the do calculus obviously does that, right? 
pun intended. And uh, identifiability, you know, it uh, considers the general question of whether you can actually do it in the first place, right? So, so yeah, it's it's a little bit of a word play here, but it's it's very important to note because it's an important distinction. And so, one interesting result we know is actually that the in the Markovian STM, so the ones we have been looking at with no hidden confounding, right? Um, given the graph and the observational distribution, you can actually get any intervention quantity via this vector adjustment formula, right? Um, while for non-Markovian SCMs, there's still a lot of effects, a lot of causal quantities that you can get, um, but for them, you might actually need the, the do calculus. And um, it's important to note, however, so Markovianity happens. I've seen a lot of paper, paper doing it, right? Um, Chiat I'll actually don't do it, which is really great. So, so they are really going into that step. And I think it's very important to, you know, long-term get away from it because it really is too strict, right? It's really assuming that you're kind of observing everything um, in the phenomenon you are interested in. Oh, we have another question. Yeah, uh, do, do you guys get a stronger, so are you making, in, a, in some sense, you're making a slightly stronger distributional assumption in the sense that you're saying, you know, you're using the same, the same functional, um, same function for every, for, every, for every node, I don't know if that buys you anything like that. I could imagine a slightly stronger distributional assumption buying you uh, weaker assumptions that you need to make in order to, to get identifiability. And I, I, I don't know if that's the case or if you do. So could you repeat just the, the, the question, the, the core of the question? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I, I guess, you know, the slight, normally there's a sort of common pattern where, you know, if you're prepared to make stronger distributional assumptions, you can get stronger identification results. Um, you know, they go beyond classical calculus. Um, you can do things with linear models that you can't do, you know, with non-parametric models is the sort of the, the typical examples. Um, I was wondering whether there's, whether the sort of distributional assumptions buy you anything, you know, by saying you're within the, the, the class of, of, of things that come from it. So I 100% I agree. So, so we really see it, right? I mean, when you have like linear models, you restrict the function class, you restrict this or that, right? And, and now suddenly you can identify things, right? I mean, there is this very famous and general example that, uh, or, or theorem actually, where we know that you know for general SCM, if in the bivariate case, if you just have two variables, you cannot tell which is the cause and which is the effect if, if it's just general, right? Um, although obviously there will be a reality, right? So, so one answer will be the correct. It's just, we, we cannot tell. Um, and in general with this, as I also said just now, right? Uh, Markovianity is too strict, I think. And you know, it's, it's pushing wrong. I think the good thing here is, I mean, we make it obviously also for the same good reasons because it's it's simple, right? But I think it's not really restricting what we are doing here. So, I mean, that's not a scientific statement now, obviously, I'm, I'm, I believe that's true, but uh, I would have to check myself. Um, but yeah, for, 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 for the things we are doing here, especially for the NCM and, and type two and the SCM GNN, it, 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 it shouldn't matter. It's just a question of comfort, yeah. Okay, then yeah, so, so this was regarding that slide. So remember, right, so identifiability really just, you know, getting uh, around doing something in, in the real world in a sense and, and identification, the actual process of, of, of knowing how to get it, uh, how to get it done. And yes, yeah, so, so actually it turns out, so, so we know for SCMs, so basically for SCMs, what, what identified, for, identifiability tells you is that if you have two SEM now, like a, a pair of SEM, which will agree on the graph and which will agree on, on the associational distributions, that um, there won't simply be two different descriptions, right? They just look different, which will, which will not now agree also on L2. But you have to put this kind of definition as well first to the, the NCM. And so this is what we did here as well, right? It also follows very naturally to what Chiat Al did, right? So there you have basically an NCM pair now and an SCM, uh, and um, you are saying, okay, they have to also agree. So, so this is really a definition you're saying you want them to match on all, on all those aspects, right? So, so really for neural causality, you have to have this equivalence uh, also established first. And then what you actually can state, which is important is that, you know, for example, the do calculus, right? So we know it's actually complete, right? We know that everything which is identifiable, you can get in a finite amount of steps 
uh, by applying that calculus, right? It's three, three rules, right? So you can do any identification. And Chiadal, and just as we now do, right? We, we kind of prove that this is also doable with neurocausality, right? That it's dual, right? So, so if and only if, right, uh, it's, it's identifiable, right? And as we said, for Markovian SCMs, that's always the case, then it'll also be able uh, to, to, to be done with an IVGA, actually, right? And obviously, you have to know that this you're considering this, this consistency measure that we defined earlier. And yeah, this is what we looked at then, right? So, so we, 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 we looked at different examples. And here you see now an actual estimation happened, right? So estimation is then, so, so the identification gives you an estimate, right? And now when you get, give data additionally to a model, and estimate that estimate, then this comes out, right? And, and what you see here now is this fa famous Bayesian network, uh, Asia, right? And uh, we look now here on two distributions. So in the middle, you see this, this L1 distribution, which is just the, the regular distribution. And you can see that the GNN with these uh, light blue bars is, is, is fitting pretty well. And now on the right side, you are seeing an intervention, right? So, so you are intervening on this uh, Turkey's node called TAP, right, tuberculosis, and um, we are setting it here to be um, Benui, right, Benui half, so, so it's really just 0.5 probability for, 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 for the binary case, and it's affecting down the road, so you see the either, the x-ray, the disp, so all this consequent uh, effects of TAP, right, uh, are also being, you know, caught by that um, intervention, and, and you are able to capture it, right, and I think that's really such a cool thing about causality, right? That you can have um, really a model that, that can talk about these things, right? That can talk about these changes, right? I mean, usually in, in, in density estimation, right? You're, you're interested in either one of those tools, but now you're here going a step further, right? You're saying, okay, we have assumptions outside and, and they dictate of how we can actually do this. Yeah, so, so kind of coming now also to an end. So let's just maybe do a recap. So um, yeah, so collectively as researchers, we're now tidying this integration. And, and I believe it's amazing to, to see also this very group here that there's so much interest, right? I mean, I hope that we are all the future generation which you know, carries some, some, some weight on our shoulders. So, so that's really cool. Um, I believe really the theoretical milestone was this recent work, which I, I think also was now accepted in Europe. And what we now saw here in our work, right, was really, you know, coming from the GNN perspective with causal glasses on, right? And then saying, okay, what, what can we get, right? And some of these things are theoretically very interesting. Some of these things are especially practically interesting and, and, and might be relevant at some point for, for, for application. Um, and obviously we try to support this, you know, with feasibility, with explicitity and feasibility results, right? And so onwards, I think there's actually a lot of interesting things we can do, right? So. So feel free to also, you know, steal ideas here from this slide that you know, would want to. So um, a different formulation of the intervention would be interesting. So, um, I mean, it's a natural formulation, right? But you could make it, make, make it stronger. I believe you can, you know, have more information on actually what the intervention, for example, is, right? I mean, we mostly now considered uh, the, the, the atomic interventions, right? Which is really just, you clamp it to one value, right? But you can have these soft interventions. So you can really just, change the dependency, right? I mean, to go back to our leading example now, the, the altitude and the temperature, right? I mean, you know, imagine now you 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 intervene on, um, yeah, you, you, you change basically the causal system, right? You, you have some kind of intervention which now allows you to, I don't know, uh, alleviate the, 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 the city you're at, right? And then reason, okay, now it's, uh, you know, getting colder right? or something like that. And then, um, also, you know, these generative models based on IGNN, I, I think also those we, we can adapt. Um, and then, you know, by this maybe have actually the whole uh, PCH, right? So, so it's really the complete uh, hierarchy, which also includes the counterfactuals. Obviously also, you know, practical scaling and deployment downstream tasks. I mean, this was really just a focus on, on, on getting people inspired on, on, on theory on that way, really, and, and pushing new and creative ideas, right? As, as, as far as it gets. Um, but I mean, obviously, all of us probably have a hunch always and really also, you know, getting these things out there, especially with all the great success. I mean, if we look also at, you know, GNNs and the work, for example, from Petal himself, right, and how it's, you know, affecting daily life with Google Maps and these things, I think 
it's just incredible, right? I mean, everyone knows these things, right? And you can just go to your friend, even if he's not a scientist or whatever, and just tell him, hey, I, I know what's happening under the hood, approximately. Um, yeah, and then I, I think really also just, you know, exploiting these causal properties more uh, to really unravel these mysteries, which, which we have, especially interpretability, right? I mean, you know, we, we can make the argument, okay, we as humans, we still don't know even ourselves what that means, right? But I, I think we can make some pretty good approximations here and there. So yeah, maybe just uh, the, the final aspect here. So I also want to take the opportunity to advertise a little bit, if I'm allowed, for some recent things we, we have done, which I, I really feel are very interesting. And some of them are actually relevant to, to, the, to the GNN stories. Actually, coming now from the per perspective that SCMs are connected to GNNs, all of them are actually relevant. So. <laughs> Yeah, so, so this was uh, our recent work. So just got accepted at NIRIPS, thankfully. So here we look at uh, some product networks. It's a tractable model class. And that's very, very important. And I think it's very underestimated in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the whole community nowadays, right? So, so especially the causal ones, right? Because we are still trying to figure out things theoretically, but uh, tractability, right? So to really be able to do an inference, right? Like if I ask you now the question, what will be the weather today? You don't want to wait two days to get an answer, right? And so this is what we looked at, right? And also again, from a causal lens. Then here, this is the, it's called intriguing parameters of SCMs, right? And by this, maybe also intriguing parameters of GNNs, right? And what you see here is um, on the right side in, an optimization problem. You see um, these W and W hat in, in, in the middle with these three rows of the three people. And this is a linear assignment problem. So it's a linear program, it's a mathematical optimization. And we change it just a little bit. So we are basically doing adversarial attacks on these things. And now what you get is um, a new matching. So, so basically each individual is getting a vaccine vaccination spot based on their health priorities. Um, and obviously the person tried to make a policy where, you know, if someone is more sick, they should have, be high priority for, for vaccination. I mean, today, nowadays, it's, it's easy uh, since there's a lot more available, but I mean, imagine in countries where that's still not the case. Um, and, and now what you see on the right side, now in the red box is, well, there was a confounder, wealth, and, and actually people who are wealthy, more wealthy than others, they actually got the vaccination first, right? And I think this is a very interesting and very troubling example, um, which could apply in a, a lot of real world scenarios. And so we should definitely consider more of this. Then here, the causal loss. So, so here we are asking the, basically the same question as with this work, right? So, so we are asking, well, what does it take to make neural models as of now more causal, right? And I think a cool example here, you see we actually even applied it to decision trees. So you see on this left side, this simple decision tree for one problem. On the right side, you see the one you get with the causal loss, right? Where you actually respect the causality. And at the bottom one, you see the same. So this big graph is the same as, so it's the same performing as the right graph, right? But the lower one is the one which you get with all the heuristics that are known for, for, for decision trees. And yeah, talking about tractability, right? So, so there's also this work now on, on neural causal inference in, in general. So, so what does it take to, to you know, make it you know, work in the real world and not scale exponentially such that it's not usable? And finally, this is the dearest for me. So, so this one is also now under review. Um, here we do interpretations. So imagine you have this blue box here, which is this Hans guy, right? And he's being described by some attributes, right? So he has some age, he has some, you know, food habits, he has a state of his health, uh, a state of his mobility. And, and now you're asking, well, why is Hans' mobility so bad, right? So you're asking a population relative question, right? You, you know all the people around you and yourself, and you have very high mobility values, and, and you're asking, well, why is Hans so low? And now let's say you have the green box as well, the, the causal uh, model or, or an assumption about the causal model. And now you can generate the thing on the right automatically. And I think that's so dope. Like Hans' mobility is bad. Well, because of his bad health, which is mostly due to his high age, right? Although his food habits are actually good, right? So you get a full, complete explanation simply from the causality, nothing more. The causality, the data, and, and the question you are asking. 
And so, um, yeah, also feel free to check it out. We actually did a human user study as well. So we, we know about uh, what's, what humans actually do. And yeah, to close off also here, just also as maybe a motivation for the whole reading group, right? And as inspiration. So this is a famous statement by Yuda, right? So, so he said, you know, as X-rays are to the surgeons, graphs are for causation. And by that, you know, stating the importance and, and relevancy of graphs. And I mean, this is a graph reading group, right? So everyone should probably know this. And I'm just now uh, yeah, manipulating it to my, my fit. I'm saying, okay, as graphs are to the causality, causal nets are for AI. So I, I truly believe they are an important step. How important, whether they are all, well, that we'll see, but they're definitely important. And so with this, uh, at least from my side, uh, yeah, we are done and, and thanks for listening and also the great discussion so far. So amazing. That's like such a good finisher. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the awesome presentation. I mean, that's just really impressive. And yeah. Okay, then a thank you from Pablo as well. But thanks, thanks, thanks. Unless other people give their questions, then I would go ahead and now, first of all, how much more time do we have? So I don't know how, how long does this reading group go usually? Um, we, we are flexible, like we had two hours a few times, we had one and a half, one ten minutes. I'm, I'm flexible as well, I, oh. I, I just, I, I can, I can be here all night. <laughs> okay, that, but then before I shoot ahead, uh, Jason has another question. <laughs> Let's hope the microphone quality is good. Okay, yeah, sorry, couldn't hear me last time. Um, I'll lean forward so you can hear me. <laughs> um, a really nice talk, uh, thanks. So, so this was great, but I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be the irritating skeptic and not, I'll, I'll play the role of the skeptic, um, um, even though I actually really like the talk. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a Practical end users, of course, of Sorry. techniques Jason. like um, the people I have. Jason. Sorry, what? When you started yes. with uh, there's yeah, a typical. Way. Oh, I, I think I just gotta stay close to my computer. No, yeah, when you started with there's a typical with cut off. So uh, just oh, okay. Can you hear me now? There again. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna just stay close to my computer. Um, try not to move around. Um, a, a lot of the end users, of course, the causality. And I sort of have economists and any epidemiologists in mind. Um, will tend to, to the extent they'll use a graph, they'll use a graph to decide whether or not their problem's confounded, and then take, you know, take the set of variables they have to con condition on and then throw away the graph and kind of proceed from there. And then, you know, the, 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 the sort of pattern there is like design the most efficient estimator you can, given the set of, of con con confounding factors and, and kind of move on from there. And the perspective you're giving is kind of, we should we should still keep the graph around and like try and estimate all the edges in the graph and and so that's a kind of very different perspective and I'm just curious a kind of is that kind of group of people the people who who are sort of using those kinds of techniques just not your target audience and if so then like who is the target audience for for some of like this I mean I think it's a theoretical exercise is really nice so I'm gonna you know that is that is definitely a, yeah, but I'm just kind of curious who, who you're thinking about as the target audience. Like, should we be trying to estimate all the all the, the edges in a in a SEM? Um, and if not, you know, how does this uh, like if you are actually talking to those kinds of people, the people who would be sort of doing the estimation, is thinking about the SEM like uh, does it still give you pretty efficient estimates, or is there something we can say in those lines? I don't know. Just basically. Uh, you get the idea. Um, I'll, I, I'll, I'll give you a chance. Yeah. No, I, I think your standpoint is, is very important and, and very correct in that sense as well. And um, I believe, I mean, there's these different camps. I 100% agree, right? I mean, you can already see like Yuda Pearl and, and, and the Tübingen people where I've been at, right? So they are already different camps. And then you have like Rubin, Holland, and, and all these others, pe other people, Susan Atte, and, you know, they all you know, um, also coming from the econometrics and, and the social sciences and everything. So, um, but I think still everyone has a common ground in the sense that, you know, everyone agrees that the graph is important. I think even if they maybe just partially use it as they say it, right, to, to you know, get rid of the confounding, but really just, I mean, what the people wanted to do and, and what they had to do, right? So, so some of these guys, I mean, 
Yuda Perl and these guys were interested in these very general results, these mathematical statements that you know give you all the power, right? And talk about, I mean, I mean, the do calculus itself, right? I mean, it's a crazy result, honestly. But then again, you have like these people maybe from 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 this camp here and in, in Germany and and related, which are are more interested in into this, uh, yeah, how do we get it to to ML now, right? Or how do we get it running? While the econometrics might be more interested in really, you know doing their, their specific statements about certain quantities, right? So, um, yeah, I, I believe so. So for me, the audience is clearly really, I mean, <laughs> here, this group as well, right? I mean, it's just, you know, we really want to push for, I mean, we should make machine learning. I mean, we want it in, to be interpretable, right? We want it to be some kind of intelligence, right? Uh, we we want all these things. And, and I think the graph is important. I think Peter would also say that, I mean, he usually starts that with the talk, right? Structured input and everything. And I think everyone also agrees here. But then again, also, um, yeah, just, just at this SCM view, I think it's also very important to, to see that there is something generating your data, right? And, and you actually usually don't know it, right? And, and you kind of have to live also with the uncertainty, right? And now we are step by step, right? Some people are making the assumptions and with this coming somewhere, some people are not making uh, bigger assumptions, but then, you know, moving slower, right? Which is just natural. So um, yeah, I, I think it's super important. We, we have to, you know, get this differentiability. And I mean, imagine like differentiable interventions, right? Uh, a learning system end to end, right? Like think of all the crazy things you could come up with and then just try to follow it and figure out. I, I think that's that's at least my motto here. <laughs> Okay, we see. I see you're excited, and I think you're getting us pretty excited as well. Yeah, guys, we should get excited. Man. This is crazy, crazy times. Um, I mean, come on, like all of us getting here together. This is just, and especially, I mean, even in, in times with pandemic and whatnot, it's amazing that we can, you know, organize ourselves. And also, uh, thanks to you, Hannes, really for you know pushing that. I mean, it usually takes one, two, three person, whatever, right, to always. You know push something a little bit more for it you know to then be able to at some point get self-sustained and i really want to props also here i i remember from the uh, summer school still that uh you know how it started and everything so it's it's really cool that this is going it's amazing and thanks again for inviting yeah the thanks for that the whole thing started from the eml summer school but then at that point let's also thank our co-hosts uh valence discovery with dominique today here Okay, but then Miriam is also still here in the uh, in the in the Zoom call, and she asked if you can go back to Theorem One. Like I think you have somewhat answered this already, but she asks about Theorem One. Does this also only hold for additive noise models, i.e., SDMs with additive U terms? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so um, we had for so theorem one was the the SCM GNN conversion, right? So we really said, okay, we have now a GNN, and we are now doing it. Um, yeah, trying to find the GNN, which really just maps to the SCM, and it boiled down to having this this um, structural equation map. So it really just point the question really just points down to the to which ones you can decompose, right? And we have this kind of proof where you can actually decompose into all the terms. It's just that for the additive noise models, it's really very natural, but for the other um, more complex one, or, or it can be simple ones, you can just have a, a product uh, of, of two variables and then you already have that dependency. So no, there's no assumption like that. Okay, but then another question in the chat, a rather broad question, but I'm curious, any thoughts on causal discovery using GNN? So, so was it from uh, Philippe Bruyard? Yeah. Uh, was he? Was he? Not? So, so I think Philippe, you were in. Uh, you actually have a causal discovery paper, right? So, if I'm not mistaken, with GNNs. But yeah, anyhow. So, I I believe in general causal discovery is, is super important, as I stated, I guess, multiple times now. Um, we should all kind of push into this direction as well. There's a lot of room of improvement and a lot of approaches now. So, GNNs. I mean, it makes sense, right, for, for, for models which naturally are graph models, right, to kind of consider that. So I guess it makes sense. Um, 
also, I mean, we have seen now recently, I think, Bayesian approaches to causal discovery. We have also the, the um, using different interventions, right? So back then from Jonas Peters, we had like this um, invariant causal prediction method. And then this was also further developed than we have now with the also learning with active interventions uh, by Nino Scherer um, and, and colleagues, where you really just use these, these different um, targeted interventions after some criterion. So um, I think all of these approaches are super interesting and pushing us step by step into this more, um, yeah, into this important uh, direction of, of, of learning the structure of a problem better and, and the mechanisms, right? I think that's really at the core of it. And as also Guadalupe said at the beginning, the uh, really having this, also this independence of mechanisms, right? This disentangled notion, you could call it. Yeah, I, I think it's it's very worthwhile doing all these directions. Yes. Thanks a lot for the great talk. Like for me, it was uh, one of my first introduction also to causal causal models, and uh, I think like uh, the, the paper is well written and your presentation is also very well done. Thank you. Uh, so thanks a lot. And regarding this question about um, causal discovery. I think uh, in, in many cases, we know which are the aspects that are related to each other and we can kind of draft the graph, but in some cases it, it might be difficult to know which is the cause and which is the outcome. Um, and I would like to know if there is a, like, um, by, uh, by building on your work, if there's a way to just have a graph without any form of direction and without any, um, any form of, um, cause and effect, have the network determined by itself, which is the cause, which is the effect. So there is actually work on that. So, so I think even like neural relational inference, which I mentioned by Kip and, and others, I mean, these things are also very strongly related to that, but I think there's exactly one paper I saw on, on, on that. I would have to look up and then I can share it also in the Slack or, or with Hannes and then, um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's work on that. And, and I mean, you have to write, you, you kind of want to be neutral in your assumptions when, when going on about the problem oftentimes as well, right? So you might not even have a, a prior, right? So you, it's, it's more like maximum likelihood opposed to maximum posteriori, so. But isn't that exactly what the neural, neural relational inference uh, paper does? Yeah, I, I don't know exactly, uh, again, for that paper, what the assumptions were or something, but I think they also, right, they use the kind of this VGAE structure and then also have, but yeah, I, I don't know whether you know, have, there, there's this question with having, for example, an empty graph, right, or having a fully connected graph, right, and and also this question of partial causality, right, or, or wrong causality, so, 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 so what kind of structure have, have, do you have to assume to not bias anything? Yeah. I'll, I'll send it in the Slack and also all of your uh, advertised papers will be, in <laughs> or maybe if you put them there yourself, then yeah. Okay, but I think we have no other questions left and then I just want to, uh, Dominique already said this point, but I think we really can highlight it. It was a really clear presentation and also an awesome um, introduction to to causal inference or structural causal structural causal models, and that's also why I really liked your your background section. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Anders. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I, I really tried to you know because I. I try to be respectful of the time everyone here has offered, right? I mean, it's for some people, it might be very early, very late, whatnot. And I mean, we are all working probably right now. So we are all also tired. So it's, it's, it's good when, you know, you can, uh, yeah, not just inspire people, but actually, you know, share knowledge and, and, and get things done. Oh, it's great background sections are, are underrated. And <laughs> also then I guess I will also say, the, the only lectures of the, the ones you shared in the beginning on causal inference was the one from, from Brady Neal. That, that's the one I watched and I can really recommend that. So the some- 100% amazing. By Brady Neal on YouTube um, about causal inference. 
it's pretty new and pretty great. Okay, another question. Uh, I just want to add to the brain new stuff. So I think 100% agree, it's amazing stuff. Also that he has a script and everything. I'm just wondering how these Mila people are doing these things. It's, it's incredible. But um, yeah, I, I think also um, he's more on the Udapal camp side, right? So which is kind of more to the, to the, to the source and a lot of these key concepts. Um, but you can also see obviously these other inspirations. So I would really recommend everyone to both watch that one and also the, the Jonas Peters MIT mini lecture series. That's, that's amazing. Okay, then let's maybe have a Suri, Suri, Surya's last question. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. It's incredible. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. So I just had a quick question. So recently there has been some effort in which uh, they have used uh, SCM, structural causal models, to solve for cyclic graph structures as well. So uh, does your work naturally carry forward to those structures or like, is it only for acyclic graphs? So I think it naturally does, but again, no, no scientific statement in that sense, I'd have to check, um, but I think it naturally does. And yeah, I, I think it's exciting how people are also move, moving beyond ducks, right? And then more and more embracing everything which can happen in the system, right? I mean, we can also always, Right. One aspect we always neglect, right, which you talk about maybe in Granger causality, right, but it's the aspect of time, right? I mean, we as humans, we always perceive time, right? We, you, you push something off the table and, and it's not like, you know, you, you need that time for it to fall down. So um, I think that's also something which is underrated, but um, uh, I think I the see. community is moving there. And just to add one more thing, uh, so since we know that transformers are graph neural networks, so can we assume that all this work that you have done can also naturally be extended to transformers? Yeah, I, I believe that we can really establish a lot of amazing connections here. Yeah? As I said earlier as well, right? some of these are, are really just theoretical playing in a sense, but I mean, they act as inspiration, I'd argue, right? And then also, you know, they are worthwhile just from that point of view. Um, some others are, are more relevant, right? And especially with transformers, which have had such such an impact right again on, on the community and made such an uproar i think uh yeah maybe may, maybe you can do this follow-up work now. <laughs> thank you so much thanks a lot it was great great to have you thanks so thank very you. good always the best papers that um push forward a lot of follow-up work or generate a lot of follow-up that, that's the best thing you can do right i mean build up on great work and then try to push for more great work i think yeah, let's see what, what comes of this story. And thank you for presenting here and for answering all of our questions. Thanks, thanks. No, great discussion, everyone. Very cool. Okay, then also thanks to everyone else for the awesome questions and thank you for your awesome answers. Then, <laughs> bye. Okay, see you. Definitely another awesome reading group session. And if you want to join these presentations yourselves via Zoom, don't forget that you can do that with the link in the description where you find the Slack channel, the Twitter, the LinkedIn, and also a mailing list where you will get weekly updates on our papers.